Welcome to another episode of Quanta Cafe. So happy you could join us today. Um, with me today, I have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Croft. She is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Monash University, which I believe is one of the top ranked uh, universities in Australia and very highly ranked globally. In fact, I was talking to one of my uh, engineers and he visited your university a couple of years ago. And he said, it's a, it's a university with ambition. So maybe we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, she is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and prior to that role, uh, Associate Dean of UBC in Canada, which is my home country now, uh, in the Faculty of Applied Science. Uh, her research areas are in industrial robotics and human robotic interaction that advance the design of intelligent controllers and interactive methods. And I think you focus on safety and making things kind of work in a predictable manner, which is which is critically important. important. Um, Elizabeth has an exceptional record of advancing women's representation and participating in engineering, and most recently as the National Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council Chair for Women in Science and Engineering, 2010 to 2015. She's won multiple awards in Canada, um, uh, and as was actually classified as one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada in 2014. Um, and she's a fellow of the SME Engineering Engineers Australia, Engineers Canada, and the Canadian Academy of Engineering. So, Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining us. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure to be here. You know, I was. Um, it's so happy. It's so 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 funny. You know, we, we we're doing this at. Uh, you're not in lockdown anymore in Australia. Maybe you could touch on that. We are still in Canada, but we met at, at the end of 2019 in Santiago, um, where we had a three-day lockdown because of the riots there and it seemed terrible at the time but right now it seems like a walk in the park uh, and you really stood out <laughs> you really stood out to me as somebody who was uh, you know very passionate about engineering you got very strong convictions uh, i call my daughter my eldest a force of nature and i think that's a that's a great way to describe yourself you get things done right um yeah and 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 really um I'm, I'm i'm so delighted to get a different perspective today you know i've spoken to people from north america i've spoken to people from Europe um, now. Interestingly, that's someone who originally came from Canada and someone who's now uh, working in Australia. So let's start the ball rolling with may maybe let me learn a little about yourself. Like what uh, what inspired you to become an engineer? Was there any kind of specific thing that happened to you or when you were young? Um, yeah, actually, uh, there were a couple of, of key points. Um, so I think uh, one of the things is I just um, I grew up with brothers and I, I was always building and I liked their stuff better than the stuff that people tried to give me. So I was much more into the Lego and the Meccano. And then the, um, the other thing that was really important is there was a professor in mechanical engineering at UBC who was a friend of my parents. And um, he had talked to me um, and showed me, he was working on the um plans he was working on the boeing 767 at the time and he was working on the jet mm -hmm. engine and he had these fantastic plans like scale plans of the boeing 767 and he just gave them to me he said you should look at these this is what engineers do and i went whoa okay that that is a thing that i think is exciting you know just being able to design and build you know be responsible for something like that it really opened my eyes to what engineering could be and i think that was so critical is first of all he he didn't exclude me because girls wouldn't like that or right? he just saw me as a person not a girl so that was really important he opened my eyes to the opportunity and he recommended it, that i should look at this so i just think there's just it's just so important when we speak to kids that we open their eyes to the opportunity that we recommend. We don't say, oh, this is hard, or, oh, you're going to have to do a lot right. of math, or right. you just say, look at this adventure. You should try this. You should look at this, and we recommend. Because I think too often with engineering, we talk about all the barriers, and we don't talk about the opportunities. So <laughs> talking about engineering, you know, and, and, and obviously there's different styles. Is, is, you've, you're now in Australia at Monash University. You spent your life in Canada before at three different places, UBC, Waterloo, and U of T. Are there any kind of distinguishable, noticeable differences about the approach to engineering down there? Um, so fundamentally, we are also at Washington Accord University. So in terms of 
just sort of the education and, and how we think about engineering, um, very similar, I would say. And I think the Washington court and the ability to have mobility for engineers is very important. So um, in that sense, um, I think there's, there's a lot of similarities. I would say that um, differences that I, I have noticed is that um, one thing that's very cool here is that there's a, an emphasis on doing double degrees which uh, oh, we have, don't have in Canada. And I think that that is um, something that really allows uh, for engineering students to have a much broader educational experience. So <laughs> most students here um, in engineering are doing engineering and arts or engineering and business, um, you know, engineering industrial design. So they are doing two degrees. And so, you know, engineering is kind of the, the because it's very structured, it's kind of the mainstream, but they use their um, business or their arts or, or whatever their second degree is as the electives. And so they put this, this package together. And I do think that delivers an incredible value um, in terms of the ed engineering education. And um, yeah, I just think it's, I think that's a very cool way of looking at an, it, um, uh, delivering uh, value to students and for employers having students come out that are really much more than just kind of it got that engineering focus that, that that they're becoming a bit more renaissance in terms of how you think of a, <laughs> uh, an engineer the the thing that i think is different in that is so great in canada is co-op okay right. so co-op right. Co-op to me is nirvana for engineers. I mean, this is the thing that we should all be doing. That, you know, I, I, I went to the University of Waterloo, blown away by how they run their co-op program. I was, I went, I was one of the earliest cohorts at UBC that did co-op. And then when I worked at, at UBC, I was responsible at, 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 during part of my time there for, the, for looking after the co-op program. And I think it is just one of the things that Canada does so well. And one of the things I have been working really hard here at, at in Australia is to really explain what co-op is to other deans, to the government, to industry, that this is what you should do. This is try before you buy for companies and it's a fantastic <laughs> value. And it's try before that you before you study that next thing for right. students. So they they it really focuses you on what you like and what you don't like, what you're interested in. It think, gets you thinking about your education in a very practical way. It's incredibly valuable on both sides. And I was just amazed when I came here that they didn't really have co-op as a thing. That, well, it's, that it's, we inter it's inter you know, we were just talking just before you joined, joined us, uh, I was talking to my colleagues there about um, the challenges that industry face in, in, in interacting with universities, especially in this day and age when you, you want to bring somebody on, you've got about 10 minutes to get them up and running, and then you want them to be, you know, fully fledged engineers. And that just doesn't yeah. happen. It's not possible. And then you've got the counter argument that universities have to train and educate students for their whole life. You know, you don't want to teach them specific proprietary software, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I agree with you. I think the co-op, I mean, it sounds to me like when you graduated, you could actually do something. I was I was rather useless. It, you know, it took me a while to become functional. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I, I guess that kind of leans into to what you you're also passionate about, which is the notion of um, hybrid and blended learning. Could you maybe share with me what that means to you? Yeah. So. Um... I think what it what it really means is you know the the we talk about the flip flipped classroom right and that I think it, that is really an important concept when you think that the lecture is just a new textbook right that is right. that is really what any you know you can get the content the lecture pretty much now from reading the textbook from going online and watching the videos but the learning is active right and right. so the learning that that is the part of the education that is the most important it's about when you're you know sitting down in a team 
or working, you know, working with a problem, asking questions, going, well, what if? It's not, a, you know, solving the problem is great. And, you know, I just, I love a great problem yeah, that comes yeah, up yeah, with yeah. a nice solution. It makes me feel so good and all the chemicals in my brain go, oh, I did something. But the real learning comes when you say, well, what if that, you know, I'm designing this engine, what if that material isn't available? Or mm -hmm. what if, you know, I'm off, you know, yes, I've operated, I've designed for this set point, but what about the startup to that set? What's going on there? Like what, you know, expanding the problems. And those come from conversation, from, from you know, going what if, from, from guided learning and from open-ended learning. And that's where, you know, what we have to do is with hybrid is to say, okay, if we're not going to have students here on campus, which is something that a lot of people have been, I mean, we went, like you, um, yeah. last year in March, uh, we had just started our semester when COVID mm -hmm. hit. We had one week on campus oh, no. oh, and no. at the beginning of the semester, and then we went to 100% online. And that was like really exciting because that was our <laughs> plan. <laughs> Um, and how many, how many students do you have just out of interest? I thought, I don't know the number. How many? 4,500 undergraduates, about <laughs> 700 postgraduate course masters, and around 900 PhD students. So how long did and it, I mean, realistic, how long did it take you to get to a point where you got to a, talk about a set point in a steady state? I mean, did you get to a steady state in that first semester? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we pivoted hard. Now, we, what we did is we... We had to week 2A and week 2B, so we <laughs> we gave ourselves a little bit of time to pivot, but we had kind of saw, saw stuff happening, and so at the beginning of March, we were already kind of going, okay, some of this is going to be online, and because we had already been putting lectures online and flipping, we were already ready for delivering online. It was about having conversations online as well, workshops, prac classes, and then, oh my God, labs! Wow, how <laughs> you did know? you how did you manage how did you manage the labs? Because your your research and your your you're very practical. I mean, you're involved in robotics and intelligent systems yeah. and so on. And so, how did you get those kind of to happen? So, so the the things that we did when we went into lockdown, we were permitted if you got a permit uh, to go in for for specific work, at least in our first lockdown, which which was, um, you know, you you you. Can only, you only go to work if you absolutely have to be there. So our PRAC our assistants, our, our teaching assistants, the only way they could deliver education for the labs was they had to be there. So we equipped them with, you know, the GoPro on your head and oh. they were they were the, the lab. And so they had the students saying, I want you to do this. So they were the arms of the students doing the lab. So that was one thing. We also, um, we quickly, quickly set up um, labs where students could uh, log in and remote control so sort of the mixing station or those kind of things. We also did a lot of um, rejigging of design projects where the design project would be based on stuff that you could buy at Bunnings and Bunnings equals Home Depot for those okay. of you who don't know. So, you know, we, we, we did that. We also had students um, work with people that were in our shop and say, I need you to build this and I'm going to describe it. And then the, the people in the shop would do the building and then they would say, well, this is what you told me to build. This is what it looks like. Is that what you want? And we also shipped parts to students all around the world. So for our electrical engineering stuff, everybody got their kits delivered to them. Wow. And then, and then they just worked on whatever whatever kind of uh, electronics project at their home. And then they would all get together on Zoom. And we learned a lot about uh, Zoom chat. We started using Slack a lot more and Discord. We just learned very quickly on the fly how to use those tools um, so that we could deliver online. This year, we still have a whole bunch of students who are still online, and we have a whole bunch of students who are here, right out yeah. there, which is yeah, so fantastic. We're so jealous. 
<laughs> I have to tell you, being able to go into a coffee shop and just see other people and mm, it's so good. Um, so now what we're doing is we're match putting groups of students together, students that are here, students that are somewhere else, and they're working together as a team. And that is actually an, a fantastic learning experience because well, that's the real world. Well, that's that's interesting because, you know, like Canada, there's a huge international student body that are not allowed to come in right now. Yep. So those are the people who are somewhere else, somewhere else in the world. Yep. And, and you're doing that international studying. So you're doing these project groups. And, and I guess that kind of leads into the notion of uh, you know, modern systems. So the, the discussion that we have all the time in our company is is the fact that no no one person can do the whole job. So right. this is a fantastic approach. In the conversations I've had with a lot of people, there's this, you know, this tension between you really have to understand the mathematics, the, the, the concepts behind, but how much of that do you need to learn? Can, can you maybe raise the bar instead of having to prove everything from first principles and spend more time doing some of the active learning? So it's both you need to know know what the fundamental understanding is, but you need to then add the why to it. So when we talk about math, I think what's critical is that you learn a math problem, you know, you solve a problem, but then you solve it in the context of something real. Okay. And that's where we work. So we you have to work very closely with the math faculty and they love it. Actually, my experience both here at Monash and at UBC and we've taught things like dynamic systems, fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, um, which are math rich. Yes, they are very much so. Problems. Yeah. We've taught them with the mathematical faculty. So we said, we have to teach students ordinary differential equations. They need to learn these things. But let's not just teach an ODE. Let's teach a circuit. Let's teach a vibrating system. Let's teach a cart pull system. Let's get them to get the equation to make something happen. So let's you know, connect it all the way through and let's show them that whether it is you know, a vibrating string or a beam or, or a electrical circuit, it's you know, the only thing that it, it, I always used to say, we've changed the variables to protect the, in, the innocent, but that's not really, <laughs> what happened, right? It's the same things. In fact, we should use the same letters every time so people could see the structure of the equation right. and, and why, what it's doing. So that is, it's about bringing it together. It's about, you know, that is, that is the heart of learning. Because if we don't do that, if we don't help students make those connections and integrate their learning, they won't put it all together. They'll compartmentalize. They're efficient. Engineer students, very but, efficient. But but you 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 just you just said something which I think was really interesting. You said it was very easy with the math department, and they love it. And and it's the same at UBC. I've talked to people all over the world where in some some countries or some universities, you know, it's 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 World War Three. You know, trying to make that happen. Uh, so um, you did that right from the very beginning. Did you do like in, in in first year students are starting to have those conversations? Yeah, yeah, and it starts with a coffee. <laughs> it starts with making friends with mathematicians. I love the mathematicians at UBC. They're fantastic. And I love the mathematicians here because they really love math and they know it's really important. And what I bring is meaning, right? right. <laughs> you know, they, I'm bringing an, uh, something that will make things wonderful with that math. I am making that math incredibly valuable. So I always approach, you know, you always want to make friends with your mathematicians and they're incredibly valuable people um, because they're going to help your students um, learn something. And, and then if you can convince them to, and, and, you know, it really does start with a conversation and mm -hmm. look, wouldn't this be wonderful and we can do it together. Because, yeah, you could have World War III, but what does that get you? How is that going to be valuable to you or your students or to your academics? Make, you know, make friends. I, 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 I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to make the point that is a really powerful lesson to anybody in business. And when you talk about soft skills that that, that uh, people want to bring or have students learn, I, I don't say they're soft skills; they're, they're professional skills, and sometimes they're really very difficult. Um, 
but having a conversation, having having a meaningful meeting, that's not hard. It's it's it's, it's and it, it it strikes me as something which makes so much sense. And then and, and to the students, you know, if they can in in their first and second year, instead of just having abstract mathematical equations thrown at them, you know, day after day relentlessly, you give them some meaning uh, from from day one. So that's and, and are you are you bringing that kind of uh, project? experience or authentic I like to call it authentic engineering experiences right into your first year program as well I mean is that how it it, it, it starts at first year so um, we had we did a we did a review in 2019 um, I invited some friends from Canada to come and, and do that review <laughs> thank you Brian thank you Boris you were awesome <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things that we did look at is how we could, um, we were doing a lot of project-based learning, but we were not connecting it up to the math. We were just saying, build something, right? And that's, no, 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 no. You can go, the, you can go too far in that direction too. So we are now in this place where we are going, okay, let's, let's start from, you know what is what is the concept what is the idea what are the models and then mm -hmm. how do we pull that all the way through to you know put it design it you know do the analysis do the you know do the math do the analysis do the testing and prototyping and see what the outcome is so pulling that all the way through in a project and that means that you know what we're going to be bringing in more of is connecting code and I think the other thing that, you know, it's going to be the big challenge for us and the big challenge for educators coming up is how do we bring more AI and machine learning? Well, actually, I'm just going to say machine learning because AI is a bit different. I'm going to say more machine learning, which again is math and statistics, really. It's probability, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's math yeah. and stats and a lot of compu computation and then bring that into it because that is a tool we need to demystify it we need to connect it back to the math that underpins it mm -hmm. and we need to have our students our engineers be comfortable with it and understand it and explain what's happening we as engineers cannot confidently explain how these systems are working where the biases under recognize where the biases in these systems come from and what the impacts of using these systems are we are neglecting our professional responsibilities to the safety and the protection protection of the public we need to be responsible for how we understand use deploy these systems so it is critical to me that we are building this into our curriculum so when this takes me on to a really interesting topic, and it's something which I think is near to your heart because your backgrounds in, in, in intelligent systems, you innately understand the complexity of design, um, you know, complex designs. It's becoming more complex because now we're connecting everything to the, to the internet. You're connecting it through the cloud to something else. And arguably there is not a single engineering discipline that isn't impacted by that. And so everybody, you know, it doesn't matter what your discipline is, you need to have that vocabulary, you need to understand it, you need to understand how it's applied and be able to yep. converse in those front. So here, here's a question for, for you. Do, do you um, have, and I've had this conversation with a few other people, the, the notion of silos of, uh, of engineering, you know, mechanical, electrical, um, civil, do you do cross-disciplinary projects? Do you try and kind of blend those throughout the pro? I'd love to hear your approach or where you think things should be going in the future. So I, I am a strong believer in the common first year. So that's where you first get that opportunity to bring students in. And even more importantly, bring academics to work together. So that's, that's mm. very important. Um, we have disciplines. We have five, um, five core departments, you know, your standard mechanero, electrical, chemical, civil. We have materials engineering, uh, very, very good materials engineering. Um, anyways, we have those five, and then we have a 10, 10, within those five departments, we have 10 uh, different streams or degrees. Um, so I think, um, I think it is important to have a core 
And then I think it's, you know, it's the T shape, right? You have your core and then you have your way of connecting it. And the way of connecting it is math is a connector. Design is a connect. The design process, really understanding what the design process is, is, a, is another really important connector. And those are what we use to pull across. So in the first year, design brings these different concepts together. And then we continue in the individual disciplines to build sort of that spine of design practice. But in our fourth year, um, we have made, we have required that all of our fourth year projects and all of our design projects are um, common across the, across the, um, the departments. And that was not without. <laughs> <laughs> A lot oh, of coffee. You know, you know the whole, uh, whole the, the accreditor won't like this or ICME will come and get us. Well, like bring them on, okay? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for you. Um, because what's, what's absolutely critical there is preparing students professionally to understand and value the other disciplines, to know that mm -hmm. they can't know everything, but to know again, how they can ask questions of their colleagues to, and work together to be able to deliver those. So we're not a hundred percent there yet, but we are much more along this, um, this path of having integrated design projects across the uh, across the final year and again it's that wonderful opportunity to bring academics to work interdisciplinarily as well because actually here there is a lot of of you know of interdisciplinary collaboration across the university we mm -hmm. have great institutes that that bring people together in um, medical engineering in data science in um, governance and policy and in sustainability. We already have that happening actually at the academic level, at the research level. Um, but getting the students to do that as well is something that uh, in engineering we're doing a lot more of. Well, I mean, I it, it, it's a, yeah, I was just going to say, it, it sounds like a, a fantastic place to go because what, what I'm hearing is you have this common first year where you get to share or learn, you know, what the meaning of engineering is and you also understand all of these kind of common concepts which Go through. You're, you're able to do a double degree. So if I was interested in the arts, or I was interested in business, or if I was interested in law, you have a different yep. perspective. And then when the engineers come together, you could talk about different things. You're not just talking about bits and bytes, or or gear wheels yep. and flywheels and things like that. And then when you get to the fourth year, you, you have this, you know, uh, authentic type problem you got to solve, which again brings it back together. And it's monitored and measured, and kind of there's a there's, there's some kind of counseling guidance coming from people all over the university from various sectors you're participating it, it, it it's wonderful um yeah can i can i can i enroll because i because i guarantee you the my well, engineering degree <laughs> i <laughs> you know i i would be embarrassed i'd probably be the slowest person in the class you know, but no all joking aside you know the when, when i hire people and going back to the industry side of things when i hire people and i ask them i very rarely ask them if they can differentiate or integrate because that's essentially table stakes. They should be able to do. They have to be able to do that to get yeah. the degree. I'm looking for character, personality, teamwork. You know those kinds of relationships and, and a level of maturity that I think um, you know, the co-op experience does, as you yeah. know. Uh, and and I think the kind of projects that you're working on also have that that kind of level of of, of maturity. Well, I think the other thing which which is important and and, and you know. Oh my, I can't believe how much time we've already chatted. It's I, I didn't think I was going to have a problem talking to you. By the way, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't be right to to end this conversation if I didn't uh, ask you to address you know your thoughts on women in engineering because it's it's an issue. I remember I made the mistake of saying to you something along the lines of it's really hard to hire women because there's only twenty percent, and you had some very strong opinions which you shared with me. So I would. And, and, and you know, by the way, I've I've taken that back and I've taken it to heart and I have made changes just just so you know. Um, so I appreciate okay. that, but, but but you weren't shy in coming forward. But if you could maybe just just joking okay. aside, it, it's a big issue. Yeah. There's there's lots of lots of concerns around this. So so how are you kind of facilitating, helping to develop the environment? You know, what what kind of things are you up to? So over since I've been here. 58% of the new academic hires have been women. 
How do you do that? Yeah. 50% of my short lists are highly appointable women. That's it. Search committees must search. That is their job. Go out there, phone a friend. Be clear, you are looking for applicants. I, I do not believe in the women only appointment stream because I think mm -hmm. it ghettoizes and it sends the wrong signal. Right. I think women, I, you know, I would not, personally, I would not apply to a position that was for women only because what that tells me is as a company, you are lazy. <laughs> but I don't work for lazy people. <laughs> okay. I, will, I know that there are fantastic women academics out there. We just need to go and compete for them. And so I have required and I have canceled searches that have not come up with a balanced shortlist. So I say, you know, there has to be, out. you know, say it's usually we look at four or five on a panel. At least two of those must be highly appointable. And 58% of the time, those women have won that competition. They won it. It is theirs. They were successful. They were fantastic. They wowed the committee and they got the job. And that's a way to set them up for success. Once you bring them in, you make sure you support them. You make sure you have mentoring for your early career academics. You make sure that um, your level, your, your top level professors understand that their job is to secure the future for the university. Their job is to ensure that the new people that we bring in are successful. That is their job. You know, it's. I'm, not, I'm completely unequivocal about that. Oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, 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 and then that has a ripple effect throughout the university and does it impact the undergraduate population and the applicants uh, coming into the university? How does that kind of develop? So if, if you can see yourself as a woman, if you can see yourself down the track, you can believe that you can be that because women do look and see you know they're seeing what is what what is what can be done what what is what is the norm they don't as a woman why do you you know if you don't see yourself in that space you're not going to go in that space if it looks like a clubhouse and smells like a a locker room <laughs> uh, no thank you yeah. women are smart and they are they value their time um i think they're you know they're they're making choices there's there young women are very, very bright. They are making choices and we have to demonstrate that engineering is a good choice for them. There's nothing wrong with the women. There's a problem with how we are presenting engineering. I was, so I, that, I, th I think that's, that's one of the kind of, to me now it's obvious, but it's one of the answers that I think comes up. It comes up time and time again. How can the image of engineering be changed? because it's not just about fast, shiny cars. There's, there's so much yep. more to engineering. As, right? I, as we started out, engineers save more lives than doctors. And yeah. I, believe, I believe that is a compelling message, whether you're a girl or a boy, that engin you know, engineering is, a, is the career that will have the most positive impact, whether it is for climate change, food security, um, supply lines, producing the, the medicines that we need, you know, do, it, the, the immunologists and the bench scientists are gonna produce little, little bits of that, which is fantastic. I think that's great. There's also a lot of engin, en, engineering in all of the kit that they're using to be able to do this science. There's a whole lot of engineering there. And then there's a whole lot of engineering in scaling it up so that it can actually be delivered to our population. So if you want to make a massive difference for good on this planet, then you want to be an engineer because you will have the greatest impact. And I do believe that is absolutely true. And it is a message that we just have to deliver. And we have to deliver it to kids very early on because we all know that by you know age 12, girls' self-efficacy and belief in their ability to be an engineer, it is just going down and it's because we haven't told them that this is for them. This is a, you know, this is a thing that girls do and it is normal and it is how they help the world. 
And so, it's teaching, you know, it, 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 it's interesting. You're, you're the third lady dean that I've managed to interview for this series. And you said exactly the same thing in, in your build up to that is that you had as very young girls, supportive uh, people, male or female, it doesn't really matter, but male or female, but people that supported your interests in, yeah. in engineering, scientific -y things like Lego, first robot, whatever it might have been. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is so important that, that, that that message gets out. So are you able to do uh, where you are now, um, outreach to that community, to the kind of... So the community that I am after are teachers. Oh. Because I'm, I'm an engineer and I look at multipliers. <laughs> right, right, right. So I, Amplifies. I, I, as a as a young academic, I went to every high school. I brought brought my robots. I did all of the stuff with you know. One person, I can get to thirty kids for one hour. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that had an impact, but I don't think it's going to be measurable because what we know is any intervention, just like any any kind of intervention, it needs to be repeated and sustained. You need to you know you need your booster shot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yep. So it needs. It, it, it needs to be a sustained inter intervention to have a an impact over time with the, the the population. So who spends the most time with kids? Well, there's moms and dads and teachers. Those are those mm -hmm. are your opportunities. I know where the teachers live. They live in schools. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that yeah yeah so that that's that's fascinating and and you know I, I i think i want to talk to you more about this kind of offline but that to me is an absolutely fantastic you know one of the people that we talked to i'm not sure if you know a lady called bonnie schmidt here in canada let's talk science are you familiar with her she's done yeah so she's done a lot of work and i haven't in the last few years for obvious reasons the last 18 months have been really difficult but her role is just that is is, is to, to help that community build a commitment to to um to spread the, the the words the the good words right and i want them i want teachers to say the e word i don't want to say i don't say that s t e m word anymore because it people just go science and they yes. forget about the engineering so i only i my thing is that we are going to say engineering we are going to talk to little kids about engineering we are going to tell them what engineering is and we can tell them that they can be you know how we tell them they can be a little scientist well they can be <laughs> awesome engineers and they can build stuff and that is what they are doing and it is empowering i'm just and looking i'm just i'm just watching the passion and it, it's interesting because i my, my daughters uh, teach music and and sometimes you, when, when i'm talking to people i can hear them next door playing the piano and teaching and they've got little kids who are 10 or 11 and, and my kids are only 22, 23 and they get excited go, that was awesome. Even if they're totally flat, even if it was terrible. And they say, that was awesome because they tried. They tried to do something indifferent. They tried to push themselves outside their box. And just the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm you bring Elizabeth is just wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to, to spend with me. Um, I, I really, you know, I, I met you, as I said, the end of 2019, an unforgettable experience because you're a very kind of dynamic person. Um, and, uh, um, you know, all the friends from Canada that were there who knew you, including my colleague, Tom Lee, you know, everyone said, oh, yes, yeah, you'll, you'll remember Elizabeth. And, and, and <laughs> so happy to have you in this, this, this series. And that passion is, is, it comes through. So uh, good luck to everything, everything you're doing uh, at Monash and, and um, they're lucky to have you. And, and for sure, like, well, let me know when you come back because um, there's lots of people I could introduce you to in my community here. <laughs> could well, I, I, I definitely need to to come, and, you know, visit and see all of my friends and family. I, I I'm getting my shot on Saturday, my first shot, so that one day. Yeah, you'll be able to come back, and <laughs> they'll let you back in the country. You know, it, I I. I uh, I have to say, you know, I'm 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 very lucky. I meet people from from all over the world, but uh, there are are in that community. It's hard to stand out. Um, you absolutely do. Um, so it's been a pleasure, and and best of luck with everything you're doing. And for sure, we'll be in touch in the very near future. Um, um, thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. It was a real pleasure.
Thank you.